Tonight we will hear from Jennifer Johnson, a Philadelphia-based sculptor who works with ceramics and fibers, as well as electronics, video, and performance to create installations. The current temporary exhibition here at Parktown Place is You Are Here, which explores the buildings we populate, the bodies we inhabit, and how we navigate the world through themes of map making and place making. Included in this show is Jennifer Johnson's Linger series, which pays special homage to Parktown Place itself and the larger movement of mid-century modern architecture. For this exhibition, Johnson made two ceramic installations that map the Parktown Place campus itself, as well as the larger downtown boom of mid-century apartment buildings in Philadelphia, and the idealism that it all represented. So without further ado, thank you, Jennifer. Hello. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight on this um, hot night. Before I dive into the pieces, I just wanted to do a little intro. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some projects and then some work by other artists that's really important to me. I've been working in ceramics for a really long time, but I started making installations in 2012. And here are a few projects that really helped with Linger. This is Binary Opposition from 2013. It's abstract, thin white hand-rolled slabs of porcelain. In 2014, I installed this piece, Funeral for Minimalism, at Tyler School of Art. It was about Carl Andre's show at Dia Beacon and Anna Mendiata's tragic death. You know, I made this array of cubes, but they were made out of tar paper. And then over, uh, over a week, the grid got all broken up and distorted and kind of became like a funeral for Anna Mendiata. This is from 2016. Let me clear up a few things. It was at Temple Contemporary. It was a show, an installation about my grandmother and her mid-20th century house. Again, very thin white porcelain flowers now. I've introduced flowers. In 2017, not, um, I went to Denmark and I made the architecture of remembering uh, that was about Nina Hole's fire sculpture, Himmel House. And I used some of the information from the funeral for minimalism to kind of have the buildings form kind of gestures of sadness and even kind of serve as a memorial for Nina Hole, who had just died. And most recently, from 2019 to 2020, I was an artist in residence at Glen Ford on the Delaware, which has an amazing art program, <coughs> environmental program, an amazing director, Ross Mitchell. Um, and I made, uh, the first piece I made was this mirror piece, which uh, when you move by it, it kind of serves up little facets of the architecture to you. And then I made a large four-part ceramic installation. Uh, I recreated the cupola that had been on top of the house in porcelain. Again, so you can see back to the, the white geometric grid that I really like. Um, and then for the first time, I made a garden piece. This is called Night Garden, and it's recreating the garden from the, the river along up to the house with the moon and the stars. And I really loved making this piece. I loved being an artist in residence. They had to kick me out eventually at the end, you know, after like two and a half years. Um, uh, so. You're not kicked out. <laughs> you know, a good bit of making art is looking at other people's work. And there are a few other installations that were really helpful to me on this project. Um, this is a piece I stumbled on at Mass Mocha in 2012. It's Graham <coughs> Patterson's Secret Citadel. Um, and I just love this piece. Uh, you know, the scale, the childlike experience of creating a self-contained world, the details, the wonkiness of it all, you know? And there's a story here 
um, almost a parallel universe. Like he recreates the whole thing inside the Citadel also. Um, you know, then it's got all the furniture kicked out of the house. It's just, the more you look, the more you discover. And it, I just, I love this piece. Um, I stumbled on this piece in Denmark uh, called uh, Talisman by an art collective. And it's a really phenomenal ceramics work. All these tiny little sculptures. It, it, it's a work in clay. It takes you from prehistoric you know, to futuristic, to celestial, you know, the shadows are as beautiful as the work itself. But probably the most important work to me and this project was um, the 1981 Charles Simmons Dwellings. It was, I think it might still be there, but the museum is closed. It's in the old Whitney staircase. And when I was at Swarthmore, he came to Swarthmore and made a site sculpture in Tarbles. And it, it was it was kind of life-changing. This isn't a picture of it. This is the one at Storm King. But he just would go and do these ceramic interventions in raw clay, you know, uncooked clay. Um, and I think this, this, this work really um, fed a lot of what I did in Linger. OK. We're done. We're done the kind of custodial um, part of the artist talk. You know, I organized the talk and s around some of the questions that motivated the work. The big question, which I think really is motivating this, is how do we make sense out of the rapid and disorienting architectural changes happening in Philadelphia right now? You know, just this week. This is a block from my studio on American Street. This is on my street, um, 36th Street. You know, you can just see the buildings are like kind of almost eating the neighborhood. And so now I'm going to move to Linger One, which is um, the first of the two big installations. So when I think about this place, I wonder about the rapid change in Philadelphia 60 or 70 years ago. So this is Linger. And what I wanted to do with this piece is cut away the ground to situate the towers on a garden of what came before. And I did a lot of research to build the ground. We're sitting right in that little side building right now. So the first thing I used were um, a lot of old maps that you can find at geohistory.org. There's a layered map viewer. This is the 1962 planning map, and you can see the towers on it. And here's the 1910 Bromley Atlas, where you can see, I mean, I left the um, modern street names on there, so you can really see where, you know, Parktown Place Boulevard was, was was Callow Hill. There were machine shops, factories, houses. This is the 1985 Bromley Atlas. And here's, we, we zoomed out a little bit because it's um, not as detailed. This is the 1808 John Hill map, um, which shows um, all the streams in the area and a much wider Schuylkill River. This is the uh, St. Helwig's Church and school, and you can see them here on this map where they actually were. They were on Wood Street near Newton Machine Tools, which probably made stuff for Baldwin locomotives. I also used the phillyhistory.org geotagged map viewer, and I was able to find all kinds of really amazing photos from the site, like these guys cut stone cutters with the houses right behind them, and some factories. And this is the corner of Callow Hill and 23rd. And they, they took photos all around this corner. When I was doing a web search, I found this bizarre blog post with photos of a model from, and I don't know when the model's from, but isn't the model amazing? 
I was so relieved I, don't, I didn't have to make this then. <laughs> um, and then I took a lot of photos from now. This is the photo that like, I see every night when I walk to Powelton Park, you know, with the light show on top. Um, and this is uh, from Spring Garden Street Bridge. And I just, I took a lot of these beautiful photos that kind of give a feeling of the site. And then lots of detail shots so that I could figure out how to make a model of it in clay. Okay, so I had all my data, my research, and then I started to make a plan for making the models of the towers. Um, this is my kiln shelf. This is as big as I can go. So I kind of move backwards from this. I need to be able to put my hands in with the piece so I can't use the full 16 inches. But I start here. Um, and then I decided I was going to 3D print little stamps for all the windows. Obviously, I don't have, if I have them for the first floor, I have them for the second floor. But, um, you know, I, I, I isolated all the different elements um, and figured out, you know, how the spacing and the this and the that. I knew, you know, I was going to make it, um, you know, a certain width. I, I was going to make it 12.675 wide, you know. Um, and so then these are the stamps that I printed. You know, right at the top, those are the gallery windows, and then there are the end windows. And, um, so then I worked from there to figure out the size of the houses that I was going to build. Um, and then I made stamps for all the housing facades. And then I started, I had jury duty. Uh, then I started uh, making layout drawings, a lot of layout drawings. Um, and then three, you know, kind of also looking at it real size, you know, taking those maps, putting it down, seeing how big the buildings were going to be. Um, this was my first prototype. It was full of errors. I didn't realize that there was a short end and a long end of the building, and I, I got the like one side, the, the things don't line up. And, and this is my second one. I added balconies. Um, but, and then, you know, I, I, I went the whole way through. I made little box, colored boxes for the top. You know, um, here's the church. Uh, here's some flowers in my kiln, my little kiln. Um, then I, I, you know, I'm just seeing what these are. This is like, February, March, seeing what it looks like, what it feels like. Um, a lot more flowers. Um, and then I, I redid the stamps so they were a little bit, they were a little bigger, and the gap between the floors was a little smaller. And so I rolled out the slab. I had a template to press in the stamps. Um, I added the balconies. Added this, you know, I built it up. And then here it is, oh, all done. You know, I had to bisque each one separately. I had all four of them. You know, I was still thinking about how to install them. What, you know, what did I really want it to feel like? How was I going to get that true melancholy going? <laughs> um, made, made, always made more flowers, more little bits. Okay. I'm all ready. I got everything. <laughs> and um, this was really, this was a blast. This was, it, I didn't have enough time, but I had everything all there. I was going to install it, you know. Um, you know, so I just, uh, you know, started to install. Um, and then here it is. It's all done. <laughs> And, um, you know, you can see, I think if you, you know, if you go and you look carefully, you can see a lot of the elements, you know, you can see things that 
or in those photos. There's also, like this is the little round built, the building at the corner of Callow Hill. And that's where it would have been under the, under the, the West Tower. And there's the stone yard with an outhouse. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I really like making the flowers. Uh, I think they might be a human presence or an emotional part of it. I loved making Linger One, but it felt like only part of the story. Um, I, I do know that my slice of the world is extremely thin, even in my own city. And if I'm going to spend time making work about it, I need to try to get outside of my bubble. So Linger Two expands the view outward to include Society Hill and University City, but also Southwark, Sharswood, Mill Creek, and Mantua. So I wanted to see what did this mid-century period look like um, uh, in different parts of the city. Um, and so, and that's, this is the piece that I ended up with. The, the scale for the first one was about one to 200. So they're about a foot high, and the tower is about 200 feet high, right? So I, I further reduced it. It's more like one to four or 500 for the small towers. It's approximate. I'm probably off. Um, so these are the reduced stamps for the little park town places, and there they are. Um, it was, there were four buildings, 18 stories, and they were built between 1957 and 1959. Society Hill Towers, Second and Locust, three buildings, um, 31 stories, designed by I.M. Pei, built in 1964. Here they are in wet clay. Here they are in little towers. Blumberg Towers, 23rd and Jefferson, little over a mile north, two buildings, 18 stories, built in 1966. And then here is the demolition, the pre-demolition that was demolished in 2016. Stamps and the um, wet clay, and then here they are. Mantua Hall, three blocks from my house. I never thought about it, right? Um, 36th and Fairmount, one building. I had to do it. It's the only one I did, but it's so close to my house, and I was so kind of oblivious to it. 18 stories, built in 1961, demolished in 2008. Mill Creek. So Mill Creek is the most idealistic. It was built by Louis Kahn. It was a part of this huge idealistic West Philadelphia project. 46th and Fairmount, three buildings, 17 stories, built 1953 to 1955. But it doesn't look like a very nice place to live. I mean, look at those tiny little windows. And then it became really, like a really sad um, place. Um, this is pre-demolition photos. Um, it was de demolished in 2002. In South Wark, uh, fourth in Washington. There were three buildings. Only two of them were demolished. One was converted into senior housing. Um, 25 stories, built 1963. And then the other one I chose, uh, the Penn Towers, it, it, the, this is very late, 1970, but there's so much controversy in the way those towers were meant to transform that part of the city. I moved to Philly in 85 and I could, it was still there, that controversy. So um, anyway, they were 40th and Locust, Three buildings, 25 stories, um, really complicated. It was really hard to make them. 
so many stamps, so many like trying to figure out how they would read properly. And so then in the end, you know, obviously I'm not gonna, I arrange them so they're kind of in good geographical proximity to each other, but it's not accurate to the map in any way. Um, you know, I, there they are um, glazed. And, uh, and I made border tiles for a frame that kind of abstracted the window patterns. You know, you could almost see them as really nice bathroom tiles or something. I didn't know what I was going to do for the garden. I, um, I thought I would just kind of do, you know, I'm really into geometric arrays. I thought I would do some kind of geometric array thing. And then I remembered this map, probably because of Amy Cohen's December article on this map. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's, uh, it's a pretty famous map now. It's Brewer's 1934 appraisal map. Uh, it's also known as the redlining map. It indicates who lives where in the city. And it also gives people letter grades. It's pretty... It, um, it justified discriminatory lending, and we can correlate this data with the struggles of various communities in Philadelphia today. So it's a, it's a very powerful map. Uh, and so I decided to use, uh, this is what the colors mean. <laughs> they aren't even like, they aren't even categories really. Like they don't make sense. Like the green is Italian. The red is colored and the blue is Jewish, right? And then I guess the white is everything else. Um, but like, anyway, and, and it's 1934, so like the world is like going through massive anti-Semitism, right? So it's just, it's like, it's such a, an amazing map. So I decided to make the garden from the map. Not that the garden caused what happened, but like, I think if we think about them together, we can uh, have a, we can think about the mid-century moment in a different way, right? So, I mean, blue flowers, I mean, blue violets and green clover and red poppies. Um, but I did make white flowers, too. I mean, little white pansies. Um, and I made them in different sizes, and I hand-made each one, and I hand-painted each one. Um, and uh, here they are, uh, and then I mortared them into place, and what's great is the white pops out because it's a dark ground. Um, and here it is in the gallery. And even though it's very geometric because, you know, I used little geometric cutters to kind of start the flowers, uh, it's also kind of, I think it feels a little wonky and very personalized. I painted, I tried to kind of paint them each flower differently so that, again, I think the flowers have a lot of emotionality and have more humanity than the original map had. It made different sizes. And I painted like some of the squares white and some of, you know, there there's different clay bodies in there. Um, so, because I don't think you really would probably know exactly, like what category do mixed families fit into, you know? Like the data, like how did they get that data? I would love to, I haven't looked into it, but I, I'd be interested in that. Claire asked me to make a little piece at the end, and I made Linker 3. You know, I wanted to relate the, the project that I made back to me right now, um, and I wanted to, you know, I'm really interested in history, but I wanted to link history to memory, you know, the cultural to the personal. You know, this project reminded me of how I felt when I was a child building a city on the rug. So when she asked me to make this piece, I decided I would make a copy of the play school building blocks that I used when I was five or six. Um, but this part of the, the whole project is probably related to what happened um, last year. Um, you know, after my 91-year-old mother died in January, I spent the year going through her things. 
Um, this picture is of my mother and father around the time that Parktown Place was built, which is when they met and married, with me following a few years later. So my lifespan is kind of like the lifespan of Parktown Place. And the blocks, too, fit right in. I imagine, you know, that there were many sets of those blocks in these apartments in the 60s, right? Uh, and I loved making the blocks, I gotta say. <laughs> um, figuring them out, making them out of clay, and glazing them. Uh, you know they're made out of clay because they have a little hole in them so they won't explode in the kiln. This is my mother reading to me around the time I would have been playing with blocks. So what I realized at this point is that, um, you know, with my mother dying, my family was experiencing this generational shift, you know, that happens, that's like pretty brutal. Um, thank you for being here, Betsy. <laughs> it means a lot. Um, and I realized that's kind of, the city went through that after World War II, the city went through something kind of like that process. And I think it's going through it again right now. Uh, you know, so here's just to end quickly, you know, this is a gallery view, and here's a detail. I loved even making the little teeny steps that go into the house, the little stoop. I'm a clay artist. It was a clay project. Um, I used about 150 or 175 pounds of clay. I fired it to uh, cone six, which is about 2250. It shrinks, porcelain shrinks about 15%, meaning, you know, when I made the towers, I had to dry it really slowly or it would crack because it really shrinks, shrinks in the kiln. Um, and I fired, my, my, my kiln did a really great job. I did over 30 firings for the project. I want to thank In Liquid um, and Parktown Place for this great opportunity. Be sure to visit You Are Here, which includes work by these artists, Paul Fabuzzi, Maria Schneider, Miriam Singer, Colleen Keefe, Miriam Rosenthal, and Deirdre Murphy. And there's a lot of more information at my website, Jennifer Johnson Clay. Thank you so much for coming. This artist talk is brought to you by Parktown Place, which is a premier air property. And it is situated here in the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. And because of that, they really have dedicated themselves to making arts and amenity. And they do this by ongoing regular arts programming. That's by exhibitions that rotate a few times a year, by artist talks like this, workshops, uh, drink crawls, and a number of different things. And they do all this not only so that their, their tenants and their residents have arts in their daily lives, but they see this as a gift back to the city that we're offering arts to the larger Philadelphia community.